Greetings, church family. We're glad we get, get together again this morning via Facebook or uh, YouTube, or whatever you're using. We're going to have a time of worship this morning, and again, we're glad that we could be together. Blessed be the name of the Lord, the glories of my God and King. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. He breaks the power of canceled sin. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His blood can make the foulest clean. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I never shall forget that day. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When Jesus washed my sins away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or your infinite wisdom who can fathom the depth of your love you are beautiful beyond description majesty enthroned above and I stand I stand in awe of you I stand I stand in awe of you holy God Too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depth of your love? You are beautiful beyond. Description, majesty enthroned above, and I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you, holy God, to whom all praise is due. I stand in awe of you, and I stand, I stand. In all of you, I stand, I stand in all of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in all of you. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the world rejoice. All the world rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. It trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. How great is our God! Sing with me, how great is our God! And all will see how great. God. 
And age to age he stands, and time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb. see how great, how great is our God, name above all names, worthy of all praise, my heart will sing how great is our Hi guys, um, Jonathan Arona here, member of Indian Hills Baptist Church. Um, first and foremost, I just want to thank you all for just joining us. We really, really appreciate it. We understand that um, these are interesting times, these are different times that we're all, all of us are kind of getting used to and settling into. And we just want to really thank you for your faithfulness um, to be here. And we just want to be equally faithful in serving you and providing you the truth of God's word to encourage you um, in this time. So we're going to be reading today out of Esther chapter 6, and we're going to be doing the entire chapter. So starting with verse 1, On that night the king could not sleep, and he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written how Mordecai had told about Bigthana and Teresha, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold and who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, What honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? The king's young men who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. And the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's young men told him, Haman is there, standing on the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, What should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman said to himself, Whom, whom should the king delight to honor more than me? And Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor... Let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse which the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes of the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them, let them lead him on the, horses, on the horse throughout the square, proclaiming before him, Thus it shall be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robes of the horse and the horses, as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. So Haman took the robes, the horse, and he dressed Mordecai and led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate. But Haman hurried to his house, mourning, with his head covered. And Haman told his wife, um, Jerish, and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men, then the, his wise men and his wife, Zerisha, said to him, If Mordecai before whom you have begun to fall is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. While they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. <laughs> Before even time began, 
my life was in his hand. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls. Here's me when I call. I have a father. Sometimes people ask why. Why do we do this? When we came up here, I didn't feel capable. Because I was scared. Why do we take our families away from places that are familiar and move to places that are far off? My wife was nine months pregnant, and we did not know one person who lived in the city. Why do we come to where there's nothing so we can try and start something? The Lord really just, He broke my heart for this city before I stepped off the plane. Why do we stress and strain and struggle and sweat just to make life better for someone else? There's so many people that are broken, that are lost, and it's heartbreaking. Yes, sometimes people ask why, and when they do, we tell them. There's places where the truth hasn't yet reached, we need to share the gospel and reach out our community. We tell them there's a God who loves them so much, He sent us. God spoke to us, broke our hearts for the city, and God's call trumps all. And we tell them there are people who love them so much. They give so that we can go. When people give uh, to missions, things happen. New believers are getting baptized. New churches are started. So when people ask why, that's what we tell them. We tell them it's the gospel. It's all about the gospel. Hey church, hope you're doing well. I hope you had a, a wonderful Resurrection Sunday last week. Chances are it's a Resurrection Sunday that we will never forget. It's one for the ages. You know, we, we talked about whenever we get through all this uh, current season that we find ourselves in and we are able to come back together and to worship together in the same building, we talked about how we're going to have a party, right? And I'm looking forward to that day. But I, I need to say something that I think some of us need to hear this morning. When we come back and when we move past this current season that we find ourselves in, things will not go back to normal, or at least the normal, the way things were before all this went down. The truth is, this current COVID crisis that we find ourselves in is shaking up the sediment of the riverbed 
to the point that it is impossible for it to settle the way it was before. Honestly, we're going to be feeling the after effects, the ripple effects from this event for years to come. But, but that's okay because the truth is God is still behind the scenes working providentially for his glory and for our benefit. In the same way that God has been moving through this book, the book of Esther that we've been walking through, God is behind the scenes doing his thing. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to open them up with me. We're going to be in Esther chapter 6 this morning. We've been walking through this letter that indirectly references God. God is never mentioned specifically, but God is behind the scenes setting himself up to be glorified and for his people to be rescued. We looked at a few weeks ago how there was this Jewish woman uh, who was in Susa. This book takes place during the reign of King Xerxes, during the time which the Israelites were returning back to the promised land from captivity in the Persian kingdom. And we find this woman, this Jewish woman, Esther, who essentially wins the first season of The Bachelor and becomes the next queen of Persia, the next wife of Queen Xerxes. On the flip side, her adopted father, Mordecai, actually finds himself essentially in the right place at the right time as well by overhearing a conspiracy between two of the king's servants in which they were conspiring to essentially kill or assassinate King Xerxes. And he got the word to the king and essentially saved the king's life. And as a result, his name was recorded in the book of records, uh, the fact that he saved the king's life. Last week we looked, or we were introduced to the villain of the story, I guess you could say, Haman, who was ascended in, uh, in, the, in the palace. He was basically promoted to become the second in command of all of Persia. Haman was an Agagite or a Melekite, which interestingly enough, Mordecai on the flip side was a Benjamite. Uh, and for those of us who study our Bibles, we know in 1 Samuel 15, Saul was uh, a Benjamite, and the Melekites were essentially Saul's uh, responsibility to to basically wipe off the off the planet. But you know, Saul being Saul, he does Saul things, and he doesn't uh, destroy the Amalekites. He allows some of them to live, and he actually takes some of their plunder. Well, here in Esther, this is essentially Saul versus the Amalekites, part two. Uh, via Mal Mal or Mordecai versus Haman. And we in we're introduced to Haman, who, again, is an Agagite. And he, he loathes Mordecai. He cannot stand Mordecai to the point that he's willing to uh, wipe out the Jewish people that are remaining in the Persian kingdom. And, and Mordecai and the people are afraid because this edict goes out that on this specific day, the Israelites will be wiped out. Mordecai mourning and lamenting uh, for that day that's approaching encourages his uh, adopted daughter Esther who's in the palace to essentially go before the king and to beg for her people's life. Esther's worried because obviously she's been uh, she's kind of fallen out of favor with the king but Mordecai helps her realize that that she finds herself in the current situation she found herself in, in the palace for such a time as this. In other words, God has been providentially behind the scenes, setting the stage for Esther to be the tool that God uses to rescue his people. And so Esther, last week we looked at how she goes to the palace, she wins the king's favor, but she, in an indirect way, she decides to play her cards right by kind of buttering up the king to, the, to a point that he, she would actually invite him to a party for a couple of days uh, to kind of butter him up again. But also she invited Hammond to this said party. Well, at the end of chapter 5, we find um, Hammond leaving the party after the first day. Hammond, he's had the time of his life. He, he's probably had a little bit too much to drink. He's probably wobbling right around. He, he's excited. It was, man, it was an awesome day. But he sees Mordecai at the king's gate, 
and he's livid. He, have you ever had those situations where maybe you, uh, man, it, it, you're having an awesome day, things are going well, you're vibing awesome, but, but then you see that one person that you don't want to see, and, and they just completely crush your vibe. Maybe, maybe it's your day off, and you're out and about, and you happen to run into your boss, and you're like, oh my gosh, I did not want to see you this day. Or maybe, maybe guys, you're having a guy's night, you're having your boys come over, maybe you're going to play some cards, and one of your boys, they bring their girl, they bring their wife, and you're just like, man, we said no wives today, right? Like, that's who Mordecai is for Haman. He's having an awesome day, and he sees Mordecai, and all that is thrown out the window. Well, we see at the end of chapter 5, he ends up going uh, home to his wife and to his friends. He gathers, gathers them all around, and he, and he tells them about how awesome he is. He tells them about the day he just had. He's, he's one of those days that chances, or one of those people that chances are we all know, that guy that or that girl that, that they always are talking about themselves. Maybe uh, they're talking about the glory days of them in high school. Uh, maybe the glory days of high school football, right? And we hear those words, man, I, I could have gone pro, but blank, right? That's who Hammond is in, in this moment. He's telling all of his friends, man, I'm awesome. I got to go to this party with the king, just me and him uh, for, the, for that Esther threw. Man, it is awesome. But he actually says these words at the end of chapter 5. He says, yet all this is worth nothing to me so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. He says, man, all these good things in my life don't matter as long as there's Mordecai there. That one thing, that one person that I cannot control, that one thing that I do not have control of, that one thing that isn't going my way, none of the other things that are going my way matter. He, he's essentially getting a little greedy here if we're honest, right? He has to have everything perfect, all of his ducks in a row. But we know that's not the way life works, right? Well, his friends and his wife, they end up giving him some advice. They say, Mordecai, why are you letting Mordecai, or, or Hammond, why are you letting Mordecai crush your vibe? Why are you letting him ruin your day? What you should do instead is build this wooden beam or this wooden stake. And it actually says 50 cubits high, which if you do the math, 50 cubits is about 900 uh, centimeter or 900 inches, which again, if you do the math a little bit further, about 75 feet. To give you a, a visual image, think of a wooden stake about seven and a half uh, stories high. And his friends say, build this stake, this wooden pole, this tree, seven and a half stories high and impale him on it. In other words, they say, Hammond, don't let him crush your day. Treat yourself. Kill him on that stake for all to see. That's when we jump into chapter six. Follow along with me. It says this, and on that night, the king could not sleep. So the king on that specific night, the language used here in chapter six is that that just, it just so happened that while Hammond's having this event or this experience in his life, the king just so happened to not be able to sleep. Almost like a coincidence, right? But we know uh, as faithful followers of Christ, we know that there are no such things as coincidences. Well, the king just could not fall asleep. Don't you hate those nights when, when you're restless and you're just laying there and you're like, oh my gosh, why can't I fall asleep? I've learned uh, after a few of those nights that oftentimes God is the one keeping me up at night and he wants me to go and to jump into his word. And, and I'll be honest, those nights are some of the best and fruitful times in God's word that I've had, that I've experienced. Well, the king, he can't sleep. And so he has essentially a bedtime story read to him. He has the, the book of memorial deeds, the chronicles or the book of records that we talked about uh, in chapter two. He had, he had some of his servants read from the book of records. And the language in verse 2, and it says this, And it was found written how Mordecai had told about Big Thana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold and who had sought to lay hands on King Ahuserxes. The language that is used here in verse 2 
is that he just happened to stumble across. He just happened to found the written record about what Mordecai did for the king in chapter 2. It's, it's almost like those situations that maybe you find yourselves in that you think about somebody that you haven't thought about in years. And then just a couple of days later, you run into them at the grocery store. Have you ever had one of those situations before? I've learned that oftentimes those situations that, where I just think about somebody and I stumble across them at the grocery store, chances are that God has ordained that moment for me to have a kingdom conversation with them. Well, Xerxes stumbled across this story that he completely forgot about because we see in verse 3, he asked this question, what honor or distinction has bestowed upon Mordecai for this? Did we do anything for Mordecai, for, for what he did for me? Did we honor him in any way? Did we give him thanks? His servants reply, nothing has been done for him. Chances are some of us may be thinking, well, how can you forget something as big as that in your moment, whether you thank the man who saved your life? How can you get to that point? How can that just slip your mind? But we can't blame Xerxes because honestly, we all think like this. We rewrite history in our minds all the time. If it, if it does not pertain to me, I, I file it in that filing cabinet in the back of my mind that I never look at again, right? Like, like here, let's do a little exercise. Think about a time when somebody has wronged you. You got it? And you can go as far back as, as you need to go. A time that somebody wronged you, hurt you. You, you got that, that, that time? Some of us may, some of us who are petty, man, we got, we just, we're still going, right? Let's flip gears a little bit. Think about a time in which you wronged somebody else. Chances are some of us have thought of a moment when we hurt or wronged somebody else, but it didn't come as quickly as the thought about somebody else wronging us, right? Because we think about ourselves. We envision, re-envision history. We rewrite history because we're the center of history in our own minds. Xerxes completely forgot about the fact that Mordecai saved his life and he never thanked him for it. And so he wanted to do something for him. And so he, he asked this question, hey, who, is anybody out in the court? Who's in the court? And speak of the devil, in verse 4, Haman had just entered into the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's young men told him, Haman is there standing in the court. Apparently, the king hasn't been able to sleep this entire night because it's morning and Mordecai, after having that terrible experience of seeing Mordecai at the gate, has already built his, his, uh, his pillar or his, his uh, wooden stake that's seven and a half stories high to impale on it. And now he's coming into the court to speak to the king about impaling Mordecai on it. And so he says, bring him in. Let, let's have a conversation. He brings him in. Haman came in. And the king asked Haman, who is the second in command, one of his most trusted allies, he asked him this question. What should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman, being the narcissist that he is, and, he, and Haman said to himself, Whom would the king delight to honor more than me? Haman is that middle school girl that thinks the universe revolves around him, right? He thinks that the king is wanting to honor him. Because who could the king want to honor more than him? Haman. And so he gives the response that he wants to give because he wants to be honored in this way. He says, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on those whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to the king's most noble officials. Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor, and let them lead on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. So Haman's uh, advice is to go, uh, is to, for the king to take the guy that he wants to thank, the, king, the guy that he wants to elevate by 
essentially putting on robes, royal robes, that the, the king himself has worn. By placing a crown on his head that the king himself has worn. To place him on a horse that only the king himself has ridden. And essentially to parade him around the town saying, this is the man that the king delights in. And this is when things begin to change. This is when uh, in, in Hammond's life, things took a turn for the worse. The king said to Hammond in verse 10, Hurry, take the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew who sits at the gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. This is when the music and the movies come to a screeching halt. And Hammond's just like, wait, what? You're not talking about me? You're talking about Mordecai? This is that M. Night Shyamalan movie twist, you know, at the end when you find out that he was dead the whole time. You're just like, what? Apparently, though, Hammond did as he was told. We don't see any necessarily any internal struggle. In verse 11, it just immediately jumps to that moment. So Hammond took the robes and the horse, and he dressed Mordecai, and he led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Apparently it was an awkward situation because we don't see any interaction between Mordecai and Hammond during this parade as, in which he is elevating this Jewish man, this sworn enemy of him and his people around the town. We, we understand that it's awkward in verse 12 because apparently when it was all over, Mordecai returned home to the king's gate, but Ham, Hammond hurried to his house mourning with his head covered. He's humbled and humiliated. Apparently they're just like, man, what just happened? This is awkward. Why is this going on? And they go their separate ways. And Hammond, he goes home to his wife and to his friends to tell them everything that just happened to him, all these terrible things that he just experienced. Chances are, parents, we've experienced this moment uh, that, that Hammond's wife and friends experience. For those of you who are parents, you, chances are you've had a moment when your little ones are outside playing and they fall and they scrape their knee and they're crying, they're bawling. They think it's like the, they just got shot, right? And you bring them in, you're trying to figure out what happened, you're trying to get the whole story and you're just like, <gasps> you're, and you're trying to you know, calm them down. Hammond eventually gets the story out to them. And this is the conclusion that his friends come to. Then his wise men and his wife, that word wise means clever. And they're clever because they see the handwriting on the wall. They say this to him. If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. They understood that they, 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 they understood that things were turning out for the worst for Hammond. They knew what was about to take place. They were clever enough to, to get the hint that Hammond found himself in that situation that chances are many of us find ourselves in. Maybe you're on the road and you get a flat tire and you're like, oh man, this is, this is terrible. Could things get any worse? And then you say that, and then what happens? It rains. It starts to rain. It starts to pour. Things are about to get even worse for him, and things are going from bad to worse. Next week, we'll look at how things continue to escalate in Hammond's life. But the truth is, today, we can all relate to Hammond. I, I know some of you are thinking, Jordan, I'm not Hammond in this story. I'm, I'm Esther or I'm Mordecai, or I'm King Xerxes. I'm, I'm not Hammond. Truth is, we all relate more to Hammond in the story than anybody else. Jordan, not me. I'm, I'm not that guy. I'm, 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 the, I'm the good guy. I'm the hero of the story. The truth is, church, we all fall short of the glory of God. We're all narcissistic, we're all pessimistic, we're all uh, selfish, and we have these evil thoughts, and we act on them. We are Hammond, and the truth is, we deserve, that. we deserve everything that is happening to Hammond and everything that will happen to Hammond because of our shortcomings and our sins. 
But here's the thing, and here's the point that I want you to recognize this morning. The amazing thing is that even though we fall short of the glory of God, God elevates us in the same way that King Xerxes elevates Mordecai. And, and he allows him to wear his robes. He allows him to wear his crown. He allows him to ride the horse that only he has ridden before. And he parades him around the city saying, this is whom I delight in. That is what Jesus does for us. Jesus lets us wear his clothes, his royal robes. He places the crown that he has worn on our head. He allows us to ride the horse that he himself has ridden. And he does that because he came here and he wore our rags and he sat in our filth and he rode that horse, the horse that we could never ride. ride. And he did it because he came and he lived a sinless and perfect life. And he ultimately died for us, conquering our sin and conquering the grave by raising from the dead three days later. Church, we are not the point of the story. We are not the lead of the story. The, the, the honest truth is we make terrible leads and we make even more terrible kings. Because of what Jesus has done for us, we should parade his name all the more. We should lift the name of Jesus on high. We should tell people about what Jesus has done for you and for me. The truth is, you're not the point of the story. Hammond is not the point of the story. Mordecai and Esther and Xerxes, they are not the point of the story. It's God who is providentially working behind the scenes for his glory and for our benefit. Honest truth is, we're, we're that kid in the Christmas play, the school Christmas play, uh, who, uh, we're, we're elf number four, right? We have no lines, and we're on the stage for maybe two minutes of the whole Christmas pageant. We're not the point. He is. So church, will you make much of Jesus today? For he is worthy of our praise. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to come together to study your word. Father, we thank you so much for the fact that you providentially worked uh, all this to be in the book of Esther. God, but we also thank you even more so for what you providentially did at the cross and the tomb. God, we thank you so much for what you're providentially doing today in our lives in the midst of this crisis. Father, Lord, we know that you are here. You are present. And because of that, Lord, we want to give you praise. We want to give you glory. And we want to give you honor. Father, Lord, we pray that we begin to parade your name around our friends and our family, our work. Uh, everywhere we go into contact with people, Lord, that we tell people about what you did for us. Father, we thank you so much for the greatest gift you've given each of us, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray all these things in your holy, precious name. Amen. Well, again, I want to say thank you so much for joining us today. I want to encourage you to like and to share and to comment on this page. Tell people on your social media account about what Jesus has done for you. Matthew 5 says that a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. In the middle of all this COVID crisis, do not allow the enemy to hide your voice and your light today. Until next time, blessings.